to Grandmaster's Choice. I am Grandmaster Dennis Borosh, and this is going to be about the French. Now, some love the French, some hate it, and some completely despise it. There was someone who didn't quite respect it too much, and his name was Saviali Tartakover. Yes, he's not even in the 20th century. I mean, he is in the 20th century, but not in the 21st. He was playing chess in the 1930s and 40s and played as magnificent players as Frank Marshall and Mr. Fine, Ruben Fine. So, without any further ado, let's see what Tartakova has as a secret recipe against the French defense. The first game is between Rudolf Spillman, who was a very aggressive tactical player himself. e4, e6, d4, d5. Now there's a gazillion moves in this type of position. I can go e5 and just cram down black's position. Go knight c3 just to retain the pressure with knight c3 or knight d2. I think there's also this weird little move of queen d3, but obviously that would waste a lot of time. Takes, queen takes, knight f6, queen h4. And even though white still has an extra pawn in the center, this queen is offside and there's still lots of pieces to develop. Anyways, Tartakova went for bishop d3, a move that had kind of a surge of popularity recently but isn't anything accurate or poisonous. So bishop d3 is the move what Tartakover played. However, it was mostly there to put Rudolf Spielmann off and probably wrong foot him. Bishop d3, c5, c3. Now, nowadays people say, oh, the French is great, the French is wonderful, oh, there's a French lecture there, French lecture over there, whoa, more French lectures. And that's all good, you know, the more material you have, the better. But facts are facts, and chess is an objective game. This dude on c8 ain't happy, and it's not going to be happy for a while. That's why people actually switched from e4, e6 to e4, c6, d4, d5, e5, and bishop f5. The system is the Karukan, and the reason they play it is because they have a good bishop compared to that terrible bishop that you can see in this position. Now, even if you think about that, Tartakova actually played somewhat dubious of a moves. Getting the bishop out early, you're supposed to get the knight out first and not the bishop. And then he is deliberately going for an isolated pawn. Normally, these would be sins that could be just punished and be normal. However, if let's say you take, take a de takes knight f6, bishop f3, you have a tough time punishing this because A, this bishop is a monster. B, this bishop on c8 is yet to be able to develop. Note it also can go to d7 because the b7 pawn is hanging. Now, I'm not claiming that white has an advantage and probably does not, but it kind of shows the downside of this whole system, the French defense as it is, has this problem with this bishop, and if you can't solve that problem, you might just well run into big issues. Knight c6, knight f3, and this is again inviting Rudolf Spillman for a tango. He's saying, hey, go ahead, exchange pawns, create an isolated pawn for me. You are still way behind in development, so it will not give you an advantage. Knight b4 could actually make some sense. Now if bishop b5, bishop d7, this would happen. This actually would be a dream scenario for black. Finally, you've got rid of the famous French bishop. And then after e5, you might even have a dangerous initiative. Because you take away the castling rights and knight d3 is incoming. This would be a beautiful position. 
but obviously White is not forced to do that and instead probably should just give up the bishop on d3, takes, takes, de, and both queen e4 and knight e4 is fine. Could even consider it takes here, queen h4. And again, here comes the same dilemma. Black has very good, I mean, has the bishop pair. Those bishops aren't too active yet, so I don't think they're that good just yet. However, if they get activated, black will have a better position due to this weak pawn on d4. But even in that case, white is not lost or not even slightly worse, which shows that this whole system is a little bit dodgy, to say the least. Knight f6 was played instead. Sorry about that. Knight f6 was played. E5, knight d7. And in this position, we are actually transposing back to a classical Tarash position. Knight d2 would be a straight transposition to these Tarash lines with knight d2, where they often play cd, cd, and f6, leading to the main line. But Tartakova uses this extra opportunity to castle, and he doesn't have to waste time getting the knight to d2. What is the benefit of castling here instead of playing knight d2? Knight d2 is a nice um, thematic move, but it does block the view of this bishop. So he will not have those extra ideas that he will have in the game. Just a little bit of a hint right there. Queen b6, and here white is at crossroads. Black puts lots of pressure on d4, and white will have to decide whether it's time to give it up or just to exchange it. The question is, dear viewer, which one would you choose? For some of you who are more familiar with knight d2 systems, you might be eager to play knight d2. By the way, bishop e3 is not a move because you run into queen takes b2, and not only do you lose a very important core pawn on b2, you might as well lose the center pawns one by one. As if knight d2, queen takes c3, and not only did black win another pawn, but the bishop is under attack, and black is just much better. So bishop e3 is never an option in these type of positions, but knight d2 is. Transposing back into these lines, c takes, c takes, knight takes d4, takes, takes, knight f3. And I've seen queen b6 and queen g4 being played before here. But queen b6 is completely fine as well. And in this specific case, black is up a pawn, but all of these pieces on c8, d7, and f8 are jumbled up, and they don't really have an easy way to get developed. So here, bishop f4 is a typical idea. So let's say bishop b7, bishop f4, castles, rook c1, and black is still struggling to actually finish development. Knight c5 often runs into bishop e3. So it's not that simple to get bishop d7 in. You might as well run into ideas of bishop c5, bishop c5, and bishop h7 with the typical Greek sacrifice. So something like takes, takes, takes on h7, knight g5. Even queen c2, if someone is not that adventurous, you could go this way and just pick, back, pick the pawn back, or knight g5 and queen h5. So even knight d2 in this position is completely acceptable for white, and this leads to good compensation. 
Not an advantage, but definitely a position that White can play for a win. In any case, here Tartakovar chose d takes c5, pinpointing the fact that this bishop on c1 had not moved yet. And also, there's no knight blocking its view. So bishop c5, queen e2. Again, there's two core concepts in this position. You want to over-defend the e5 pawn and the f2 pawn. If any of them becomes a target, you will have a tough time. Queen c7, and the key move, bishop f4. Now white has this extra move that you normally don't have in any systems whenever your knight is on d2 because it's stuck on c1 and you physically can't move to f4. So with this extra move in, the idea of Tartakovar playing three bishop d3 comes alive. And now it's just very problematic for black as there's no clear counterplay just yet, or at least I cannot find any. f6, which would be a thematic idea known in the French, fails to e takes f6 and the king will be in danger. So like f6 takes, takes, queen takes, king d8, oop, fg, and the pawn promotes. And if there's no f6, there's no clear way for black to try to get the initiative himself. So it goes bishop e7, trying to untangle with the bishop e7, knight c5. However, when your opponent is starting to play slower moves and decide not to castle, you've got to think about options of punishing your opponent for this misbehavior. So let's think about that a little bit. So f6 doesn't really work. We don't have to fear that at all. Now, Logically, you could think about knight d2, just connecting the rooks. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, when we think about punishing moves such as bishop e7, queen c7, we're thinking about moves that will take away even more space from our opponent or push them even further back. So here, the move that was played by Tartakovar was none other than c4. And for the uninitiated, this looks strange. Why did you play c3 and then suddenly play c4? That doesn't make any sense. Well, the circumstances have changed a lot. In this position, you want to keep this connect for alive. Therefore, you played c3, knight f3, and made sure that this pawn is defended. But then you shifted gears, took the pawn, takes queen e2, bishop f4, bishop e7, and suddenly there came an opportunity to attack the black king. Now it's a solid closed position. So from a strategical point of view, the French is sound. The pawn structure is quite nice, and it does give a sturdy structure. However, because of that, the bishop on c8 is closed in. Now c4 doesn't help the role of that bishop. It's still closed in. It can't really move. But after c4, now you have this very, very good square for the knight on c3. And now there'll be some pressure on d5. So knight b4. Immediately, Spillman is going for some counter chances on the other side of the board, hoping to muster up some play or at least win a pawn as a form of compensation. Knight b4. Now if you would take, bishop takes c4, castles, knight c3, this would be quite terrible for black because there's at least one, two, and three moves to make till black actually completes full development. 
while white might just hop into d6, kind of making black's life miserable. So c4 was played at b4, trying to attack this bishop and targeting that pawn on c4. Now, depending on your style, you would choose your next move. Some might play knight c3, the likes of Shirov or Mihal Tal would play knight c3 here, saying, the devil may care, I'm giving up the pawn, and if you take it, you open up files. So let's say queen c4, queen d2, your queen is misplaced, and it might actually come under fire after rook c1, and if d takes c4, I drop back, and I can go knight e4, knight d6, the same plan we mentioned before, or alternatively knight b5, knight d6, hitting the queen, and then locating the knight that juicy square. However, Tartakover said, I have a better position. There is no reason for me to take extra risks, or at least not yet. So he played knight d2 instead. Knight d3, queen takes d3, knight b6. So some of you might exclaim that, hey, black does have the bishop bear. Why doesn't that count for a whole lot in this position? And I can tell you why. This position ain't that good because it's a closed position. Bishops need open lines and open files to actually be useful. Not here, not in this position. They're rather useless because they don't really have any targets yet. And it will require two more moves for black to actually fix his development. Not to mention that he didn't castle either. Rook c1, very strong move, immediately saying that, I know you haven't developed at all, so it's time for me to go all out with the attack. d takes c4, knight takes c4. Here black doesn't really have a choice. You'd love to put the knight on d5, but in that case there's knight d6 check and you're losing the queen. So black is obliged to take, rook takes c4, queen a5. And again, here comes the big question time. Black is still a couple of moves away from completing development, a couple of moves away from playing bishop d7, bishop c6, or castles. So we've got to figure out a way to continue with the attack. I'll give you guys a little bit of time to think about the next move. So whenever we're looking at these positions, we first identify what our opponent's goals are and also what defenders we have to remove to kind of weaken their position. And if you realize which piece is the strongest defender in black's position, Tartakova's next move isn't that hard. But it's still quite a nice idea by Dr. Tartakova. So one of the ideas would be to go bishop g5, trying to exchange. However, it would be costly. It, will, it would cost you a pawn. Right, g5, queen takes c5. And not that this isn't an interesting option. You could even consider going f4 and going for an attack here. Now queen f6 would be a bad mistake because there's knight e4 and knight d6 going all out with the attack probably would be decisive. But Tartakova felt that there's no need to go for bishop g5 immediately and give up a pawn. He decided to go bishop d2. Now, bishop d2 also gives up a pawn, but there is a quality difference between the e5 pawn and the a2 one. 
the e5 pawn makes sure this bishop on c8 cannot breathe. And that is much more important than that pawn on a2, which actually does absolutely nothing for white. And if it's there or not there, it doesn't really matter for Mr. Tartakover. Queen takes a2, rook c1, immediately going for the attack, bishop d7. And black might have thought, hey, I'm only a single move away from completing my development, and I've been going to have a beautiful, beautiful time over here. Get the bishop on c6, I castle, I'm up a pawn, I will be winning this game. But Tartakover said, no, 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 I'm going to go rook c7. And that rook on the 7th is going to wreak some havoc over there. Bishop c6, there's some nice little tactics that white has. Namely, rook takes c6, b takes, and queen d7, and the queen will go gobble town on all of those pieces and pawns until it is checkmate. So bishop c6 is a no-go. You can quite play there because I take and queen d7. So black had to go rook d8. And I'm pretty sure, as Spillman was a very strong player, he calculated this far and said, hey, it's a fine deal. If you would take anything, I will have a discovered attack with my rook. So what is the problem in this position? Hint, hint, there are some problems in this position. So he actually said, hey, I don't see the problem with taking on b7. Probably in his calculations, Spillman thought that, hey, if you do that, I go bishop c6, and with your rook hanging and your queen under attack, it's a double attack, so you'll be in trouble. By the way, a side note, black cannot just castle because you lose the bishop on d7, takes, takes, Queen takes d7, and white is just up a whole piece. So at this moment, Spillman was forced to enter this line of bishop c6 and attacking. But I'm quite sure that Spillman was happy at this moment, saying, hey, okay, you're forcing me to win the exchange. Be my guest. However, the rude awakening is about to come. Boom, rook takes e7, king takes e7, and by in itself this wouldn't be an issue for Spillman. You can't win the bishop, your queen is under attack on d3. However, there's this check on g5, black must block, but that's, as you can tell, never a good sign. If you have to play f6, and it's not for the reason of undermining, probably you're doing something wrong. And in this case, it's not nothing different. White takes on f6, gf, bishop f6, which is a very nice little touch. King takes, queen c3, king e7. Problem is, the king, rook, are not too well coordinated, and especially that queen on a2 is far, far away from the action, not where it's supposed to be. So king e7 is played, and here white plays this very nice little intermezzo, queen c5 check. And seemingly all is fine after rook d6. Spilmont thought that I, I defend the bishop, I'm up a whole rook. What can really go wrong? But after queen g5 check, surprisingly enough, it's difficult to coordinate all these guys. If you go king f7, you run into knight e5 ideas. And if you go king f8, 
and I just go queen e5, and suddenly you can't defend the rook on h8 or d6. Something similar happened in the game. Spillman played king e8, queen e5, double attacking rook g8, queen takes d6, bishop f3, and it looks really good from afar, but with this queen so far away, it's clear that this is going to be checkmate. Rook c8 check was played, king f7, queen f3, and the end of the day, after king g7, you run into queen g5, and I'm going to capture everything with the check, and it's game over. So very nice game by Tartakover. He went for a subline of the French variation, not necessarily the best line, but something that is practically challenging. Don't forget that this was played in 1913s, uh, like in 1913, and for that, this was quite a high quality game. So let's take a look at another Tartakover game that was really well played by him. This one is played between Emmanuel Lasker and Tartakover. So e4, e6, d4, d5, knight c3, knight f6, and the big rage of our times is e5, knight d7, f4, c5, and knight f3, knight c6, bishop e3. Again, I've seen many players play bishop e3 early, but there is a simple rule to follow whenever you're studying openings. Always de develop your knights first and get the bishop next. You can go wrong in that case. So knight f3, knight c6, and bishop e3. This is the main line currently and is hotly debated. Now, this became like really the hot topic once Kramnik started playing 1e4 and he suddenly beat it, uh, Rajabov, in this opening. But in the 1920s, 30s, bishop g5 was the main line, championed by none other than the great French-Russian grandmaster Alyohin, or Alakine, whichever way you want to pronounce his name. Bishop e7, e5, knight d7, a solid system, very, very solid way of playing. Black is trying to undermine white's position later on with c5. However, Aliyahin had a favorite patented line here, and it is h4. The whole point is, I am willing to give up the pawn, but for that, you are going to give me an active rook, and eventually, after some knight slaloming, I might have some targets on g7. So Lasker, as a gentleman as he was, he took the pawn, takes six, knight h3, queen h6. Now, queen h6 is not the move that I would love too much, because, yes, it stops this rook from exerting direct pressure on against the king side. However, the queen is misplaced for little to no good reason. But if you go queen e7, white can go knight f4, and you would face this knight slalom, which is kind of annoying, provoking some extra weaknesses on the king side. So if you're not really familiar, this is kind of like a banker structure with white, where you give up a pawn, but you get very aggressive play on these open files on the h and g. Sometimes you can even go queen g4 pressing on that g pawn. But in any case, Emmanuel Lasker played queen h6, g3, a6, f4. And that's kind of a tricky maneuver by Tartakover. You might have expected him to go bishop g2 and then play knight f4 anyways. But that wasn't really his point. He is just trying to create a very solid center over there, and g3 kind of fits into that plan. a6, stopping this knight b5 jump. If you would go c5 here, there's knight b5, and you have to deal with these forks. And last but not least, that knight could land on d6 and something that you wouldn't want to have. So 
So a6 was played, f4, c5, and that's why lost square played a6, bishop d3. So the bishop and most of these French positions belong to d3 because it exerts pressure on h7. You could put it on g2, and it creates a uh, good defensive setup for your king, but it's not really active, and in fact, this whole construction of d5, e6, f7 is built against that. So bishop d3, g6, and I wonder if you guys can guess Tartakovic's next move. If you've seen the last game, you might actually realize that, hey, Tartakovic is an aggressive player. So the next move shouldn't be too tough to find. And a few words about Lasker. Even though his contemporaries said that he wasn't a sound player, the semi-slav that you know and the concept of breaking through with c5 and b5 on the queen side, that was actually devised by Lasker. So his methods are actually very high level and that's kind of the reason why he was so competitive, even in his 50s, he was putting up some and posting some good results versus the best of the best. Who could challenge him? Probably recent time Anand, as someone who's at Lasker's level, and the late Viktor Korchnoi, of course. Both of them, Anand and Korchnoi, is kind of living up to the heritage of Emmanuel Lasker. And even in this game, you can see he likes to break through with a6 and c5. However, it does take a lot of time, and Tartakover takes the initiative, goes for queen f3. What's the point of queen f3? He is going for long castling and sets up some sacrificial ideas on d5. Note that even though Lasker is up a pawn, most of his pieces are scattered and there's not much communication going on with those pieces. Again, something that you don't want to do is to play knight e2 early. You might want black to commit if he, she is going to go cd or c4. Because if you go knight e2 way too early, this is a typical way of losing a bishop, c4. And there is no convenient place for the bishop to hide. So queen f3, and that's what Tartakovic exactly does. He doesn't really want to show his hands, and he's asking Mr. Emmanuel Lasker, where are you going to put your pawn? Emmanuel Lasker tells him and takes on d4. Knight e2, knight c6. Now, knight takes d5 is probably a little bit premature because white is not castled yet and doesn't have enough forces to break through with the attack. And one of the key features of future grandmasters and the best of the past, best of the best in the past, that they would go for sacrifices when they felt that they have adequate play for the piece or of a rook sacrifice. So knight d2, knight c6, knight g5, Finally, with this queen defending this rook, it's time for some active play. Queen g7, queen f2, and probably this knight is trying to waltz back to the game. And if he could take on d4 with a knight, that would be an ideal French position for Tartakover. Knight f3, knight c5, long castles. And we actually have a similar situation like in the previous game, black does have a solid position, but desperately lacks development. Bishop d7, knight d4, long castles. And again, here comes the critical point of the game. You have to figure out what to do. If I look at it, I'd say black is doing okay, but so does white. White has a wonderful knight on d4 a good grip over the center, and 
Lasker is oceans away from actually having that F6 break in. And if there's no F6 breaks, that means that Tartakovar should have the upper hand. However, it's one thing to have a static advantage, meaning you have the control, so everything is looking good, you have more space, and you have the initiative. Actually, you don't really have the initiative quite yet. You did have some pressure on the h-file, but that kind of dis <clears throat> excuse me, dissipated. So we have to look for a different way to break through. <clears throat> and for that, Tartakovar found this very nice move of knight takes c6. Completely illogical if you would ask anyone. It's illogical because every exchange helps your opponent. However, Tartakovar has a plan in mind. Now you can't capture back because this pony is hanging on c5. But knight d3, rook takes d3, bishop takes c6. Black does get into a terrible formation that you really don't want to have. Black is saddened with a French bishop, and once Tartakovar gets the knight to d4, it will have no future at all. But first and foremost, Tartakovar is going for the attack. He goes for queen a7, making sure the king cannot go to b8, and it is forced into the middle of the board, somewhere around here. King c7, rook b3, immediately eyeing the king. Now, if white would get one extra move, it would be completely busted for Lasker because that bishop, once it's eliminated, the attack is just crashing through. And again, same thing that we said about in the previous game, those pieces just don't contribute to the defenses. d4. d4 is a very strong move by Lasker. Even though he's in grave danger and probably lost, this is the most tenacious way of defending. And if you've noticed, most of the world champions are very good defenders. Name it Lasker, Carlsen, Kasparov, Karpov. They're very good at defending. Anytime they see the slightest of counter chances, they will go for it. The reason I extol this move d4 is because it activates this bishop and at least tries to look for some play, even though his king is under heavy fire. Queen b6, king c8, rook d1. And that is also a sign of a strong player. Tartakovar is not panicking, just brings in another piece and prepares this idea of knight d4. Good or bad, I think, Lasker should have taken on f3, play rook d7, and hope. He decided to play rook d5 instead, but I'm not a fan. Kind of closes that bishop on c6. Rook d8, rook d5, bishop d5, rook c3, king d7, knight d4. And as predicted, once the knight lands on d4, the end is nigh. Queen f8. But queen f8 was already not such a pretty move that you would want to play. And now it's white to move and get the final touches. So let's think about this a little bit. Now this king is a little bit iffy, but it's still not that easy to come around it and actually checkmate that king on d7. Compared to the bishop on c6, which was blocked by that d5 pawn, this bishop is actually quite useful, defending the most crucial squares on e6 and b7. So if you're trying to crash through quickly, you might want to remove that defender. 
So the first move obviously is rook c7 check, king e8. Sadly enough, no checks. If we could give a queen a4 check, that would be brilliant. So we had an idea of queen a5, queen a4. However, slow is still something that Tartakova could have considered, but he saw a much quicker plan, and he played c4 instead. A brave move in some ways, because you are exposing your king. So if it's not a direct win, it is somewhat risky. But I'm pretty sure Tartakova calculated this. Now the bishop is under danger. Bishop e4. And here comes the decisive blow. I take c6. And it is a game over. Because if f takes e6, queen takes e6, there is no way of stopping mate on e7. Quite a picturesque end to the game. All of Black's pieces are on the 8th rank, except that bishop. So at least that bishop succeeded in getting out of that miserable square of c8. However, the king got mated on the middle of the board, which is kind of sad, but checkmate is checkmate. Quite a nice game by Tartakover. And what I really enjoyed in this game is that he was relentless. He started going, he gave up a pawn, but at the end of the day, what he was looking for is active peace play and making sure that that bishop on c6 is smothered. And when it wasn't, it was already too late. The knight jumped in on d4, and there was nothing that the opponent could do. So that was the games I wanted to show for you guys, and hope you enjoyed Tartakover's brilliant wins and his recipe against the French. Take care.